let's get to Jeff Patterson, who joins us from Edmonton. He got to see the Nation HQ offices. We'll see. I'll tell you in a second if he's coming to us from there. No, he is not. He's in a fancy hotel. Beautiful. Jeff, how's your time in Edmonton been? Uh, it's a glorious day here today. Harm can back me up on that one. I, people probably don't want to hear that, but uh, I think this is about as close to a postcard kind of day as you can get uh, in the Alberta capital. It was smoky when we arrived here from the forest fires, but uh, that's all cleared out. And uh, I went for a nice walk down along the river valley. Uh, it was actually a spectacular uh, day here, but uh, we're here for business and that's a, a big hockey game tonight. And uh, really looking forward to it. And I heard you guys talking about uh, you know, the morning skate this morning. I, I will add that a little bit of intrigue on the Canucks side in as much as Rick Tockett suggested that there might be a lineup change. Now, I, at first I thought he was kind of hinting at Noah Juleson, but we all know that Carson Soucy is not going to play, but um, Noah Strang from Daily Hive came at him directly and just said, like, Juleson's in. He said yes, but earlier he had said that he was contemplating a lineup change, uh, which I would imagine would be to his forward group. So we'll see. We saw I made two the other night, a uh, winning lineup. I'd be surprised if he made a coach's decision to go away from the 12 skaters that he used the other night, but uh, he does have some extras. Obviously, Hoaglander is here. Uh, Vasily Pod Colson's here as a, a black ace. Uh, Phil DiGiuseppe's not. He's back in Vancouver. He said that uh, he would rejoin the hockey club for practice tomorrow if they have a practice. But, uh, uh, you know, so he's got some options, but I would just think that you'd stick with the lineup that got the job done uh, on Sunday night here in game number three. Uh, Jay Pat, when you look at the Oilers splitting up McDavid and Dry Settle um, game tonight, do you think that was the right decision from their end? And what do you think that means from the Canucks' perspective in terms of how they're going to have to potentially adjust? Yeah, I mean, this all strikes me as uh, Chris Knobloch getting a little antsy and making some decisions here based on the series and where it is, and his team is trailing and recognizing that they really can't afford to go down three to one. I mean, could they come back from a three one deficit? Sure. But uh, the odds are stacked against them at that point. So their best chance is getting a win here on home ice tonight and sending it back to Vancouver and two all tie. But yeah, I mean, what a luxury to have as a head coach to be able to split those guys, but also know that you can put them back together for a turbo charge at any time. They have been an absolute handful for the Canucks to uh, try to control. Now the Canucks have done a nice job of, keeping them to the perimeter. And really, when you look at McDavid in the series, guys, five points, but four of them came in game two. So the two other games, the Canucks have really limited him and they've forced him to play on the outside. And that's how Rick Tockett wants it. Uh, and we'll see if they can continue to do that. We'll see if McDavid's able to find ways to get to the inside as the uh, breakaway goal in game two. But, you know, that's it for him. And when I look at the series, uh, I, the fact that only three Oilers forwards have scored, that their defensemen have generated more goals through three games than their forward group. And that's a forward group that includes two of the best players in the National Hockey League and Zach Hyman, who got off to an incredible start in the series. But they've got nothing, absolutely nothing from anybody below those big three. So I think that's part of why they're going away from the stacked lines to start this hockey game is they need others to get involved. Like, you know, Ryan Nugent Hopkins has a couple of points, but on the power play, you know, Vander Kane, uh, boy, I thought Knobloch was really trying to butter up a guy like Dylan Holloway. Uh, clearly, he knows him better than I do, but watching through three games, I haven't seen an awful lot from him. Uh, Warren Fogle, you know, on and on it goes. Like, it can't just be their big three. I mean, it's an incredible like, big three that can carry the day on a lot of nights, but over a seven-game series, uh, you need some others. And, you know, just the Canucks would say the same, that they've got some guys that they'd like to see contribute as well. But the Canucks have goals from six forwards, at least through three games, and the others have just three. So, you know, that's one of the storylines, absolutely, that's emerging here. The other one for me is uh, the Oilers have four power play goals on eight attempts, 50%, incredible. But the Canucks have three power play goals of their own. So the, the net difference is one. Three games into this series, the Oilers have outscored the Canucks by one on the power play. That is a massive win for the Vancouver Canucks when I thought about the way this series is going to shape up. And, and along those lines as well, the Canucks have had more power plays than the Oilers. Like I, I just I, I didn't know if I could live in a world where that was even a possibility through three games, but power plays are 9-8. And when you think of some of the penalties, a too many men on the ice call 40 seconds into the series, and Pia Suter putting a puck over the glass, you know, those are two of the Oilers power plays. So Really, the Canucks have done a pretty nice job of you know, sticking to their systems, not taking needless penalties, 
And I mean, best way to limit that uh, Oiler power play, obviously, is to stay out of the box. So I think, you know, on those fronts, the Canucks have done a pretty nice job of sticking to their game plan. But again, any night is a, an opportunity for McDavid to explode, to, you know, the Canucks to run into some penalty problems, uh, things to go sideways. But, you know, the way that they're playing, the way they're locked in right now, man, they look like a confident bunch. And I think they believe that they can leave town here with both games in Edmonton and a 3-1 series lead. Speaking of the power play, what have you liked about Vancouver's man advantage? Because like you said, they've got three goals. It seems like they're finally getting going uh, for the first time, maybe since the All-Star break. Yeah, and it was funny listening to JT this morning after the morning skate. I mean, he was dumping all over the power play. He said, hey, we were opportunistic the other night. I mean, there's an element of that. I liked uh, the puck movement. Um, showing some different looks of, you know, hard rims on the power play to get the Oilers running around, move the puck from one side to the other. Uh, there was the double, in fact, that really stretched the Oilers out of their defensive formation and allowed Brock Besser to find that soft spot on the ice. Um, you know, Lindholm obviously stepping in the deflection the other night that like, you know, both of his goals in tough areas on the ice. Uh, I, you know, I, I like that. So, um, yeah, I guess I'm a little more bullish on their power play right now after watching the Nashville series where it was such a struggle for the Canucks to, you know, two power play goals in the Nashville series both came in the same game and here they're up to three power play goals. So, you know, their power play has been fine. It's just that it's kind of been, you know, gauged against what's on the other side and that's the greatest power play that the National Hockey League has ever seen and and again, it's 4 for 8 in this series. So, the Oilers have done their thing on the power play. They have two five-on-five five goals from forwards. Connor McDavid on a breakaway and Zach Hyman with that uh, sort of knuckle puck that made it 4-1 to one in the first game. So, again, give the Canuck team a ton of credit for the way they're defending. It may not look great on the shot clock, ultimately, but the Canucks have shown they're pretty comfortable in those situations, that there isn't this a panic threshold, that they're, you know, they have the way that they, they know sort of this path forward to success and... You know, did it blow up in their face a little bit in game two? Yeah, because they got the lead and they thought they could do what they do on a lot of nights. Didn't work for them that night. They lost in overtime. But otherwise, well, Canucks have done a pretty nice job when they get out in front and being able to extend their lead the other night. I thought that was huge as well. So uh, let's see how many power play go, or how many power plays they get ultimately. And then, uh, you know, can they continue to cash in? Because this was an Oiler penalty kill that didn't give a single goal against the LA Kings. Canucks have already broken them for three. And Let's be honest, some of that's on the back of the goaltender that's going to be watching from the end of the bench tonight. Let's talk about that, Jeff. Uh, no surprise for me that they're starting Calvin Pickard. It looked like there was some discussion going on, uh, you know, in various hockey circles, people talking about if they should go with Skinner or Pickard. Captain Canuck in our YouTube live chat is pointing out that not only has Pickard never played an NHL playoff game, he's played five playoff games through his entire junior and AHL career. That's it. Five playoff games for him. He steps in tonight. Uh, help us size up the goaltending battle. Yeah, I mean, this is now one of these storylines. A third stringer who has delivered for the Vancouver Canucks and a backup and a career journeyman who, you know, rediscovered his NHL career. He's a great story. And credit to him. He came out. He met the media. He spoke on game day this morning. The Oilers allowed their starting goaltender to, you know, this massive throng in the locker room. Uh, down-to-earth guy, appreciative of the opportunity, and just said all the right things about approaching it like it's just another game, but clearly it's not. Um, and that's where I come back to the coach. You know, this kind of feels a little bit desperate, but at the same time, you're not getting saves from the guy that you had hoped and the organization had hoped and the city and fan base had believed in. And, you know, here we are with McDavid and Drysaddle leading the playoffs and scoring again. And what's the biggest issue in Edmonton? Oh, yeah, it's goaltending. Like, some things never change. And, and so... Um, you know, it's a tough spot for Calvin Pickard, but it was a tough spot for Arthur Silovs. And goalies are a strange lot. Like, he might rise to the challenge and take the net from Stuart Skinner. Like, who knows? Um, Skinner certainly hasn't done enough to earn the confidence of his group. So, uh, yeah, I think if you're Pickard, you have to look at it as an opportunity. You can't be worried about, uh, you know, what might happen if things don't go your way. I think you have to just look at this as an opportunity to put your stamp on a series here. You know, he got in for 16 minutes the other night, uh, didn't face many shots, and he said it was just good to, you know, actually be in the 
environment there rather than sitting on the end of the bench to be in and and sort of seeing it from ice level. And so, you know, he's going to try and draw on anything that he can. But really, I mean, you know, his best inspiration might be the guy 200 feet away in as much as Arthur Silas was thrown into a really tough situation in Nashville on the road, delivered victories there. And here is uh, Calvin Pickard. You know, this is what these guys train for, right? Like he wants the net. It's always a numbers game with goaltenders. And uh, he's got his chance tonight. So we'll see. But, you know, if I'm the Canucks, pepper this guy. Like, you know, make him make some saves. Like, don't ease him into this series like you did in the third period. They didn't need more offense the other night, but it starts from scratch. It's 0 0. Test him. Make him make some saves. That's the guy. So I am kind of curious to see, you know, what kind of game plan we get from the Vancouver Canucks because, uh, uh, you know, this guy obviously doesn't have this body of work, as you just mentioned. And, you know, I saw, was it uh, Brandon Assel out in, in Abbotsford that tweeted out that, you know, these two goalies faced off last year in an American Hockey League playoff game. So not that that's going to weigh on either of them, <laughs> but a tiny little bit of history there. I, I just, let me add as well, and this goes off the topic of goaltending, but like it's such a hot topic here in Edmonton, as you can appreciate but so is this whole idea of, you know, where's the secondary scoring and uh, all these, like, imagine if those storylines didn't exist. I think the heat would be so hot on Elias Pettersson from both sides, but nobody, like, there's not a single person that's talking about Elias Pettersson four games into the series because there are front burner issues, uh, the suspension, the fine, the McDavid treatment, all the, like, all of that, I think, is benefiting Elias Pettersson because two Canadian markets, massive media scrums, and I, I don't know, Harm, like, I haven't even seen Petey in the locker room. Like He is keeping as low a profile right now. And again, I, I just think some of this benefits him that nobody is talking about a guy that had 102 points a year ago in 89. We know his struggles. We've documented them on the Vancouver side, but I think the Edmonton media would be uh, all over him if there weren't bigger issues for the home team in this series right now. I wonder how much of that is just like, we don't have high expectations anymore. Uh, been not great since the all-star break showed maybe some flashes late in the Nashville series, but you know, obviously I, I, you're, couple, you're totally yeah. right, Dave. I just think that like the outside media guys that maybe haven't like, you know, Fair. they just see Elias Pedersen as an all-star and, and I, I think it would be a bigger deal except that there are, bigger deals <laughs> there are actually bigger deals uh in the here and now yeah and I, I imagine part of it too is they're winning right if the yes. Canucks were yep. down to one like yep. I imagine a lot of that would be um discussed shifting topics a little bit one of the big storylines in Edmonton that I saw among the fan base after game three and the Susie McDavid incident was this idea around there was no pushback and where was the response now, Susie being suspended for one game, I expect that to sort of cool the temperature a little bit. But still, especially in a media and fan market as hot as that, do you think that the Oilers will be in, in a mode of seeking a little bit of retrib retribution um, in tonight's game? I do. Uh, I think they have to be careful of, you know, not veering from the script too far because... If they do take penalties, we've seen that the Canucks power plays coming to life here. But you're right. There's a fan base here that I think is demanding some, you know, some blood. There's there's bloodlust in Edmonton that, uh, you know, they abused Connor McDavid and there was no real pushback. And I think the fans have voiced that and the players have probably heard that. And again, I go back to, you know, Evander Kane has been remarkably quiet. He's kind of had a running battle with Nikita Zadorov, but he's been on the wrong end and truly was on the wrong end of the big hit when he got thrown into the bench there the other night. I can't get over how little I've noticed Corey Perry through three games. Now, when five guys are playing half the game, there isn't a lot of ice time to go around for the others. But he's just been a complete non-factor. And not that I expected him to have a massive impact during the run of play, but I thought after every whistle, I thought he'd be in Silov's face. I thought he'd be a guy, I, like, without a program. I'm not even sure I could find him right now. You know, DeHarnay, another big guy that can be physical. I do wonder if somebody on this other team tries to take it upon themselves to challenge Nikita Zadorov to, you know, which probably isn't the wisest thing, but at the same time, like that's not a trade-off I want if I'm the Vancouver Canucks. Like I, I don't, Zadorov means too much to the Canucks right now, especially with Susie out of the lineup tonight. 
to sit for five minutes against Evander Kane, who has been totally ineffective in this series. So I do wonder if the organization has had to talk to Zadorov in any way because, uh, you know, he's not afraid, obviously, and he's shown a willingness to, to stick up for teammates. But I do wonder if he could be goaded into a fight. I think that would be to the detriment of the Vancouver Canucks four games into a series in which they have a lead right now. So uh, I, I wonder if the Oilers try to provoke a little bit more Dakota Joshua with a massive hit on Ekholm early in the hockey game. Like, you know, do you expect something? I, I guess I do expect somebody on the Oilers to try to lay that kind of hit on Quinn Hughes or whoever it is on the Vancouver Canucks. So, yeah, I, I think that, look, it's spicy already through three games. And I think that we're just going to add a few more peppers uh, to the pot here uh, as this series goes along. And that's what we want, right? Like, you want competitive hockey. You want storylines. Uh, you know, I don't need Connor McDavid getting cross-checked in the face. Um, so we'll see if lessons were learned there and if does, you know, does that lower the temperature at all? But I just love the fact that this thing is unfolding the way that I had hoped it would between two Canadian franchises and two Canadian fan bases. Uh, what'd you think of the suspension, the fine, the lack of fine on the Oilers side, anything like that? What'd you think of that? Yeah, I, I'm not surprised. I mean, I cross checked to the face, even with the circumstances and Carson Soucy's a pretty honest guy. You could tell like when we had the chance to talk to him, you know, I think he showed some remorse. He was hoping that he'd be able to play tonight, but I'm not the least bit surprised that uh, he gets a one game suspension. I, I just find it baffling though, quite frankly, that there are two teams in this series there were players on both sides involved at the end of the game and only the Canucks get sanctioned and they, two of them, like, you know, the $5,000 fine, that's not a big deal. Zdorov laughed that off. But like, if you're the National Hockey League and you want to send a message, who better to send a message through than Connor McDavid? Like, you know, I'm not getting worked up. It was a slash to the pants. But if I'm the league, I'm making a statement about we want to cut off the crap after the final buzzer. that. You know, between the whistles, play hard. You know, we've got referees that can call penalties. But after, like, it's not just a free-for-all after the final buzzer. And if you slap McDavid with a $5,000 fine, he can put it on his credit card before he leaves the building. <laughs> um, the money's not the issue here. It's more just, like, the league sort of trying to send a message through the best player on the planet. Because I, I thought they missed an opportunity with the Derek Ryan with the how you doing on Hoaglander in game two. Yeah. Like that was BS to me. And I thought the league could have come in after. And again, same thing. Uh, a fine's not going to be a big deal to the player, but it just shows that people at the league office are now watching. You're, you know, you've got a letter on your file, that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, Zadorf's got stitches on the side of his eye. Like Hyman, people are, oh, Hyman didn't make contact. Like it's not performative art at this point of the playoffs. He needed stitches. And, He's, you know, he's a big dude. Like that's the definition of a high stick. If you're getting a cross check up <laughs> onto the eye of Nikita Zadorov, that's a high stick. Um, so, you know, I, I just thought that the league missed an opportunity here um, to send a message to both teams. And for whatever reason, and people can, you know, buy their own conspiracy theories, but it just does seem strange that the Canucks were the only ones that got uh, slapped with any sort of action. For the most part, it's felt like, from a Canucks perspective, looking at their blue line, that they've deployed the quote-unquote second and quote-unquote third pairs relatively even in terms of distributing the minutes. But without Susi, Zdorov obviously bumping up, and now you've got Cole, who struggled in this series, and Juleson, who's only played two games in the last six weeks. Would you load up on the second pair's minutes and try and shelter the third pair? What's your, what's your confidence level at with, with Cole and, and Juleson as a potential third pair? Yeah, I, I think, you know, Chris Knobloch is the last change here. This is going to be interesting to see with the matchups because I think if I'm in his shoes and I'm splitting McDavid and Dreisaitl, I probably try to get McDavid and his speed out against Myers and Sidorov, who have been known to take penalties, right? And attack with speed, see if you get some stick calls there. That would leave Dreisaitl, who is such a physical beast, against Hughes and Heronic, if you can get that matchup or against Cole and Juleson, obviously. But if you're just looking at, you know, the Canucks are trying to counter and playing their, their top four a little bit more in this hockey game. Um, you know, it's Quinn Hughes is just at a physical disadvantage. If he's trying to match up, he can use his smarts and his positioning and all that kind of stuff. But dry sort of leans on guys a lot bigger than Quinn Hughes and, and is able to have success there. So I am really curious to see what the Oilers do with last change and their matchup and, you know, to answer your question, Harm, about confidence, yeah, I mean, it's been a bit tough go for Ian Cole. It has. 
And now, uh, you know, he's moving back to his natural side, we think. So maybe that puts him in a bit more of a comfort zone. Uh, Juleson gives you what he can. And and Noah Juleson has resurrected his NHL career at the very least. Uh, but he's also shown that he's the seventh guy when they're fully healthy here. So that's a tough spot. I mean, the Canucks have done a remarkable job in this series and really all season with that whole next man up thing. I think guys like Juleson believe in that, that, you know, when an opportunity presents itself, you step in and you don't have to be the star, but just don't let the group down either. And I don't expect that Noah Juleson's going to let this group down. Uh, he can be physical. He's not afraid, blocks a ton of shots, eats pucks that way. Again, you hope the Canucks don't get into penalty problems, but if they do, um, you know, he's going to be counted on to kill some penalties against the best power play in the National Hockey League. So it's a tough spot, but we saw Nils Amon got thrown into that same deal and he was killing penalties in the third period of a tight game and he hadn't played in a while either. So, um, you know, the blueprint's there and we'll see if uh, next man up just continues to serve the Canucks well here uh, in these playoffs. Jeff, just before we let you go, I know Zach Cassian's on rink wide tonight, so people can look forward to that. And of course, you're going to be on rink wide as you always are. People can also look forward to that. <laughs> But I was thinking about this recently, just the playoffs that JT Miller has had. And it feels like he's kind of becoming someone that we're not talking enough about. Just the idea of him being a leader on this team and doing everything that he does while putting up points. Uh, what can you say about JT Miller uh, and his playoff performance so far? Yeah, I'm not surprised at all. I'm, you know, I mean, obviously he had an incredible regular season, but this is another guy that I think thinks he was built for playoff hockey and he's proving it on a nightly basis but you're right like his offensive contributions are sort of flying under the radar uh he's had back-to-back -back two assist games so he's not scoring maybe as much but he's setting up others and there's certainly value in that and again i, I just think that right now we glom on to the hottest of hot topics and uh, a guy that's kind of just consistently really good for the Canucks. That's not all that sexy. He just shows up, he plays, and he he performs on a nightly basis. But where's the controversy? You know, where are the hot takes around that? Uh, and so it kind of gets lost in the shuffle a little bit. But, you know, I mean, this guy absolutely is the uh, heartbeat of the Canucks, uh, wears his emotions on his sleeve, uh, you know, gets involved physically, but also has uh, the skill that we've seen in his time in Vancouver to be one of the offensive thrusts of this hockey club. But, you know, Brock, is kind of stealing some of the limelight with the playoffs that he is having. And I'm sure JT is just fine with that. But yeah, I mean, I think that's really all it is, is that there are other guys, good and bad, that maybe have stood out, you know, and, and drawn our attention. And just through it all, JP, JT has continued to find that same consistency that he had in the regular season. Um, you know, he's not running too hot. Like, you know, we've seen that in the past. Like, even as these games heat up and the, uh, the temperature of the games rises, you know, he's playing within the rules. He's not hurting the team. We're not seeing frustration when they're down. And in fact, you've heard Rick talk and talk about like thinking about game one when they were down by three uh, and talk it loved the bench, you know, because there was this belief. I think in years gone by, a guy like JT could sour a little bit. And maybe there isn't that great energy in the body language and everything else. But, um, you know, guys take their cue off him. And uh, he's just been, he's had a really good playoff run, even it ha has been sort of, understated, which is a word that we just generally don't uh, associate with a guy like JT Miller. Jeff, great stuff as always. As I mentioned, Zach Cassian on Rink Wide Vancouver tonight. People can find it shortly after the final buzzer, and you'll be joining live from Edmonton. Good stuff, Jeff. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks. There he is, Jeff Patterson, who, as I mentioned a few times, and I will continue to mention every time he's on the show, you can find him on Rink Wide Vancouver. Great product. Uh, best post-game show in the business, if you ask me. Uh, and yeah, like I said, Zach Cassian is going to join the show. Uh, Shane O'Brien. A lot of people really like Shane O'Brien on the last episode. We've had Eddie Lack on the show. Uh, yeah, really, really good, good product going over there at Rinkwide Vancouver. So be sure to check it out. Jeff is going to join live from Edmonton. Canucks Conversation is live Monday through Friday, every weekday at 2 p.m. over on the Canucks Army YouTube channel. Make sure you like, subscribe, and interact in the YouTube live chat every day with us, folks.